Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Good Systems postdoc presentation series. My name is Leah Sabatini and I'm the program director for Good Systems. Good Systems is a grand research challenge here at UT Austin. We have a team of more than 70 researchers from across disciplines working to define, evaluate, and build human-centered artificial intelligence systems. Before we get started today, I wanna to share that the event will be recorded, it's being recorded now, and we'll reserve some time towards the end of the talk for Q&A. So please put your questions in the chat um, throughout the talk, or you can use the raise hand function after the talk. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Vendelin Kovacev. Vendelin is a postdoctoral research fellow working on the Good Systems core research project, Designing Responsible AI Technologies to Curb Disinformation with Dr. Matt Lees. Vendelin obtained his PhD in Cognitive Science and Language from the University of Barcelona, Spain in July 2020. In 2020 and 2021, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Birmingham in the UK, and his current research focuses on natural language processing, computational semantics, and curbing disinformation online. And Aline, with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much for the um, for the introduction, and thank you everybody for uh, joining the talk. Um, I will share my screen now. Um, so the title for today's talk is very broad and it is human centric and data centric natural language processing. Um, throughout uh, the presentation, I will try to make it a little bit more specific and tell you what do I mean uh, with those terms. Um, so this is the general outline. I will have a brief introduction, talk a little bit about my prior work um, and then focus on one specific project that we're currently developing at UT that is active learning uh, with rationals. So a little bit about me. Um, I am originally from Bulgaria. That is a small Eastern European country, mostly known for um, cheese, yogurt, and occasional soccer player. Um, I, as already mentioned, uh, did my PhD at the University of Barcelona, working on computational semantics and text domain relations. And then I did uh, a short postdoc at the University of Birmingham, working on um, automatic scoring of theory of mind or mind reading. In general, my interests and my areas of research are natural language processing, computational linguistics, and uh, data-centric AI. So let's start very briefly with where we are currently in natural language processing and the current state of, of NLP. Um, in the past couple of years, there have been a very uh, vast popularity of neural network and specifically of one type of neural network called the transformer neural network model. Um, and those models has resulted in drastic improvement on benchmark data sets. One example that I have included here is the GLUE benchmark that is a very popular benchmark on natural language understanding. Um, so tasks that we hypothesize require human reasoning uh, or human level reasoning. Um, and then we can see the, the leaderboard on this benchmark that um, it contains multiple tasks. So it contains tasks like detecting paraphrases or logical inference or question answering. Um, and we can see that for the majority of those tasks, the performance is in the 90s and 90s in these kind of glue scores. So that is a measure that they are using is close to perfect. And in some cases, it's even surpassing human performance, at least um, according to those metrics. Um, and we can see here another picture of how, how the, the NLP field has been developing in the last couple of years. Um, this is a, a graph of model power and complexity as a function of time. Um, so we can see that just in three years from 2017 to 2020, the number of parameters and the size of the models grew from about 94 millions to 17 billions. Um, so this is, um, this is the development of the models. We're getting more powerful and more complex model uh, every year. Um, however, these very powerful models come with some limitations and those are limitations that I'm interested in and those are things that I would like to explore further in my um, academic future. Um, so one of, the, one of the limitations is that 
every algorithm is limited by the available data and the quality of the data that, that it has to use. So if your data is flawed or biased, um, then the model trained on it is also going to be flawed and biased. And even if it is perfect for the data that we have, it is not going to be perfect for the user scenario that we have. And we know uh, many situations of models that are um, racist or uh, are actively discriminating against certain parts of the population. And in many cases, this is due to problems in the data. Even the perfect model cannot, cannot avoid that. And the other problem is that the, the flawed data makes many models um, vulnerable to what we call adversarial attacks. So that is, if uh, a specific input is created, the model is going to make a very wrong prediction um, for, uh, for surface reasons. So that is the limitation of the data, but there is a, also a limitation of the users and how we apply those models in practice. In many tasks, we actually cannot just grab a model off the shelf and put it to work. We need to consider the stakeholders um, in the task and actively involve them in the process. We might involve the stakeholders in the task design by asking what they want from the, uh, from the solution and what an ideal solution would look for them. But we also might want to involve them even more actively in the model pipeline by gathering data, performing evaluation, or even hybrid human in the loop models that have a two-way interaction between humans and um, algorithms. And so this leads to um, my definition of what I, what I call data-centric and human-centric NLP. I focus on those two issues um, and I argue that a data-centric NLP should treat the data as a first-class citizen and should focus on having quality data for the models and not just obtaining anything that we get and then feeding it into very powerful and very complex neural network models. And the human-centric um, aspect of NLP for me is that we need to model the tasks with the end users in mind and also involve those end users in the process. And so this was the very brief introduction and now I'm going to mention some prior work that I did in uh, my PhD and in my previous postdoc. Um, during my PhD, I was mostly concerned with textual meaning relations um, and the meta questions on textual meaning relations is how does the meaning of a text, typically one sentence, relate to the meaning of another text or sentence? And here we have some examples. Um, so if we focus on the central sentence that is education is equal for all children, um, we have four other examples such as education is equal for all kids, some kids receive better education and education exists. Now in linguistics and also in, in actual language processing, there are several textual meaning relations that are, that are of interest, such as, for example, paraphrasing. And we can see that the two orange sentences are have approximately the same meaning, so they are called paraphrases. Um, another interesting meaning relation is the meaning relation of contradiction, uh, which is between the orange and the red sentence. So if education is equal for all children, then it is not possible that some kids receive better education and vice versa. So if some kids receive better education, then obviously education is not equal. So the, the assumption here is that these two sentences cannot be true at the same time. Only one of them can be true. Um, and the third example is what we call entailment. That is, if we know that education is equal for all children, we can safely assume that education is something that exists, um, at least in linguistics. Uh, and if you go to, to philosophy, then it, it might get slightly more uh, complicated than that. But this is the general frame of um, determining textual meaning relations. The question is usually, given two sentences, can you determine what is the relation between them? Uh, what, can we what can we tell about them? And in, in natural language processing, uh, the question is, how can we do this automatically? without having human look at the sentence and, and process it. And so my approach to that was um, strictly data centric. So I tried to analyze and improve the existing benchmarks and, um, and data for, um, for automatic detection of textual meaning relations. Um, and I showed empirically via multiple experiments that 
the data is not representative of the task. There are, there are many flaws in it. Mall strain on the standard data can fail um, unit testing and have biases in them. And finally, uh, I demonstrated by improving the data, we can improve the models and get closer to what we really want to do. And then that is understanding human language by uh, machines. So um, these are some uh, peer review articles that I published on the topic during my PhD, um, mostly between 2018 and 2020 in uh, various uh, venues for, for natural language processing and computational linguistics. Um, and then after that, I moved to Birmingham to a very interesting project focusing on automatic scoring for theory of mind. So for, the, for those that are not familiar, theory of mind, or also known as mind reading, is the capacity to attribute mental states such as desires, belief, knowledge to others in order to predict or explain their behavior. So this is a very important cognitive skill that allows us to communicate with people around us to put ourselves in someone else's place and understand um, why they are acting in a certain way or predict of certain behavior that might occur in the future. Um, it is a task that is very novel for NLP, so nobody has worked on that um, extensively before we started exploring it. It involves an uh, interdisciplinary team of computer scientists, linguists, and psychologists, and it has a vast social and educational impact since designing a tool for automatic scoring can help early um, the diagnosis of certain developmental psycho de developmental conditions and allow for large scale testing and um, improve the education by certain interventions that a psychologist can uh, can run. So we took a very human centric approach on this on this problem. We involved the stakeholders in the task design from the first moment we started, we asked them to design the properties of what a perfect solution would look to them and what kind of common human mistakes and issues they are aware of that we might expect from automated systems as well. But we also involved the stakeholders in the machine learning pipeline by um, involving them in a the process of data acquisition and data augmentation, and also by having them perform a detailed error analysis on the systems. And our success story here has two parts. The first uh, was expected and the, the second one, not so much. Um, we successfully implemented an algorithm for automatic scoring, which was our primary goal. But as a, as a byproduct, during our collaboration with a stakeholder, we actually managed to improve the original psychological task. By seeing how machines perform the task and what kind of errors they make, psychologists were able to go back and improve the instructions, data, and methodology for analysis on the task carried out by humans. And these are some articles that um, we published on the topic. And now with that, um, with that being said, we are now moving towards a, a research project that we have recently started on active learning with rationals. As I, as I mentioned, this is a very early stage project. It's a joint work with Anubrata Das, Matt Lee, Didi Jo, Suyang Li, and Shi Chi Dai. Um, it combines both the data-centric aspect and the human-centric aspect of natural language processing, as I understand them. Um, and since it is a very early stage project, um, I welcome any feedback, comments, and ideas. Uh, we are still at a, at a stage where we can incorporate them in the, uh, in the process. So, the classical NLP pipeline, as we mentioned, involves creating or reusing a data set, training a supervised machine learning model, and obtaining high quality performance in terms of accuracy or F1 or other quantitative score. And ideally, this has to be done at low monetary and computational cost or as low as possible. However, our goals are slightly different, or at least mine are. I don't want to focus only on classification accuracy. I instead want to design NLP solutions intelligently in a way that we mitigate data-related issues and improve the end user experience. And so we pose two research questions. The first one being, what forms of supervision can we elicit from people 
and what are the cost benefits of each form to create better data sets, in our case for um, automatic fact checking. And second, how can we more intelligently correct, collect supervision for model explanations in order to improve the quality of those explanations and the trust of the users. And before I go to our methodology, I will go through some uh, background on different techniques for NLP and classification. So we start by the very standard um, vanilla classification model in which the pipeline goes as follows. We have some data. Um, so let's say we start with multiple sentences that we want to classify as positive or negative in terms of their sentiment. So we start with this movie was great and this movie was terrible. We then perform a process called data annotation where we have humans assign a label to each of these instances. So for this movie was great, we have somebody look and say, hey, this is a positive review. For this movie was terrible, we have somebody put the negative label and say, this, this review, this reviewer did not like the movie. We then take the combination of the text and the label. So this movie was great and positive and this food was terrible and negative. And we give them to the model as examples. And we expect that a model after a certain period of training is going to perform well on unseen examples. So in this case, after some training, we are asking the model, what do you think about the sentence? I love that hotel. And, um, Hopefully our model here, the little robot head goes like, I think that is positive. Um, so that is the most standard and more vanilla classification approach. However, it has a lot of limitations. One of them in terms of interpretability. So historically we used to use models called feature-based models. And in those models, it was relatively plausible to identify why a model makes a certain decision by looking at the process of classification and the, what is important for the model, you could argue, well, there is a reasoning behind this model and this reasoning is human interpretable in a way that um, we can then use it to justify to other humans. However, with the rising popularity of neural network models, interpretability is becoming an issue in, inter in uh, deep neural networks we very often have what we call the black box. So this is an example of a black box model. We have some mathematical representation of the input, something happens in between, and then we get to a mathematical representation of the output, which is usually some probabilities or some decision function, um, and, uh, and a label. And so the model looks at the text and says it's positive, but we have no idea why or we can look at the numbers, but those numbers mean nothing to us as humans. And um, this can be a very big problem when you have models making decisions such as hiring decisions um, uh, or um, automatic filtering of information, for example, since those decisions can be biased and discriminative and you cannot determine that without knowing the reasoning. Um, so you don't know if the model took a decision because of, an, of a bias or if the model was objective and really took the best decision in the situation. So one approach, there has been a lot of work on interpretability. One approach is to using what we call extractive rationals. Extractive rationals are a simple form of um, explanation where we basically ask the model to identify the most important part of the input. And here we have examples. If our sentence is, I love this movie, I've seen it, I, I've seen it many times and it's still awesome, we would like the model to not just say this is positive, but also to say, well, we have words like love and awesome, and they indicate a positive, um, a positive sentiment for this uh, text. Or if the example is this movie is bad, I don't like it at all, it is terrible then we want to identify the whole text as negative, but also we want to identify key elements such as bad, don't like, and terrible. And then when the model tries to justify the decision to a human, it doesn't only provide the label, but also say, hey, this is why I think the, mo the, the movie review or the, the text is in general positive or negative. So how does a classification work when we have rationals? It is in fact a very similar model. 
So we start again with the raw data. So this movie was great and this food was terrible. And then we have the annotation. However, this time, instead of getting just the label, so is it positive or negative, we also ask humans to provide justification. So in this case, a human is looking in the first example and saying, this is a positive example and it is positive because of the word great. In the second example, the human would say, this is a negative example and it is negative because of the word terrible. We train the model with this data and hopefully if everything works great, um, as a result, when we ask the model about the sentence, I love that hotel, the model is going to say, this is positive and it's positive because it contains the word love. Now, taking a, a, slight, um, a slight tangent, we, we focus on a technique called active learning which can be applied both to rationals and non-rationals and is central to our research. So traditionally what we do is we get all of the data, every instance, and we annotate them all and give them all to the model. However, there is an intuition that some instances are more informative and more unique than others. And it might be more useful to just ask the model for um, to identify instances that are more informative or interesting or let them all ask for help as opposed to just give it all information. So the data-driven approach combines the annotation with the model uncertainty. So in this example, we have a large number of sentences such as this movie was great, this movie was really great, that was a great movie and amazing acting skills. And then we tell to the model you can ask two questions. So you can ask, you don't know anything about these two, these four sentences. You can ask us to provide you information about two, which are the two that you really like, um, or which are the two that you have problems with. And so the model, ideally you should look and say, hey, the first three sentences are very similar. I don't need to ask you for all three of them. I can ask for just one and then assume that the other two are the same. So, I can ask two questions and those two questions are, can you tell me more about this movie was great? And can you tell me more about amazing acting skills? Because this is the strange thing at the end that we don't, we cannot um, derive from, from the first three. And uh, this happens as an iterative process. So what happens is that the model identifies those instances. We ask humans to provide information, we then give those instances to the model, the model retrains using those new information and then repeats the process until um, it gets, well, until we run out of money or until the, the model gets perfect performance on everything. And what happens with active learning is that it makes a very efficient use of data. It, um, it improves the coverage by identifying unique examples and examples that are, that are less frequent. Um, and uh, it generally improves the performance of the model and reduces some biases. Another technique that we're interested in is the technique called pre-labeling. So what we saw right now is model asking for human help and saying, can you just tell me anything about that? However, we can enhance that. And when asking for help, we actually provide a suggestion. So this improves the annotation quality and trust and reduces the time for it. So instead of just asking the human, please tell me about amazing acting skills, we can also include what model thinks about that instance. So in this case, the robot says, well, I think it's positive and I think it's positive because of the word skills. Now, obviously we know that that is wrong. Um, it's positive because of amazing, but this shows us a little bit of what the, the model reasoning is and it allows the human communicating with the robot to make the necessary corrections and um, guide it in the correct direction. So our approach is combining all of the above ways to elicit supervision of the model. We aim to improve the quality and the coverage of the data and we also aim to improve the user understanding and trust. Our main novel contributions are, this is the first work that combines active learning rationals and transformer models in such a way. 
Um, this is the first proposed work that uses supervision by corrected generated rationals as opposed to um, just asking for the rationals. And uh, we are also proposing a novel rational based active learning strategy that is driving which examples are being selected. We have several hypotheses on what we, we expect to find and um, what um, our technology can, um, can achieve. So we assume that system perform better with human provided corrected rationals than with machine generated rationals. We assume that active learning can reduce the cost of collecting rationals while maintaining or even improving performance in some cases. Um, we assume that rational based active learning following our new algorithm can perform on par or better than existing strategies. And finally, we, we think that correcting rather than generating rationals can improve human understanding and trust in the system. Our application domain is the automatic fact-checking task, which has been shown to be challenging for fully automated systems and may require a hybrid human computer interaction systems. It also requires explainability because um, it has humans involved in the process and it requires user trust and a higher level of interaction. So we believe that this system is very uh, good fit for this domain. As for results, as I mentioned, this is still an early, um, early development. So stay tuned for that. We've got our best researchers working on it um, and hopefully we'll be able to, to report something um, soon. And to conclude this talk, um, I started by trying to convince you that models are great and are getting better, but that's not everything that you should care about when you do natural language processing. Performance can often be limited by flawed data and that is, that is often overlooked. And models don't always take into account the end users. And in that case, the great performance on benchmarks doesn't transition into practical improvements on, on tasks that humans use. So I argue that we need more focus on the data and more focus on the end users. And the project that I, that I presented is focused on active learning with rationals. It is a novel early stage project that combines both the human centric and the data centric approach to NLP. Um, our two research questions are, what forms of supervision can we elicit from, from people? Uh, and what are the costs and benefits of each form to create better data sets? And how can we more intelligently collect supervision or model explanations in order to improve their quality um, and result in trust for um, end users? And with that, um, I will conclude my presentations. I am open for questions, comments, or suggestions on our research. Um, and these are my uh, contacts for anybody that wants to get in touch with me. Hey, thank you for that great talk. And we'll open it up for questions. I, I don't see anything in the chat at the moment, but feel free to raise your hand or just speak up if you have a question. All right, I see James. Go ahead and ask your question. Or maybe that was like an applause emoji. Yeah, I think <laughs> it was the applause. Sorry. I think it was the applause emoji. <laughs> Um, I can ask a question. Great. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Ivan Lin, great talk. Um, I just wanted to, I'm just curious that you have had the very interesting work on theory of mind and kind of understanding um, that from, from, a, from, a, from a computational perspective. I'm, I'm curious and uh, call me out if, if that's not the case is that how do you see even at a, at a broad level that that work connecting to the explainability side of things and do you see some 
some ways of uh, even at an inspiration level uh, might channel uh, the the current work on 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 user centric explanations um thank you so that's a that's an interesting question that i can take from like two different perspectives um so one is how my work in um theory of mind connects to explainability and then the, the other one is like how theory of mind itself can focus on uh, improving the explainability and the first one um we were trying to follow a lot of good practices while designing the um the system so we tried to involve a lot of human provided classes on errors and um, and predictions so that the system can be more informative when making a prediction than just giving a label um, and this this was the part that actually led to improving of the task because we asked stakeholders to actually think about um, the problem that they have further than just providing the labels and think about what kind of information is going to be useful in addition to just um, to just saying the label. So we were focusing on certain impredibility techniques over there um, involving, uh, involving psychologists mostly. And then how can we use theory of mind in interpretability? So can, can that, can these two links? Um, absolutely, I would say, but it is also very, non-trivial problem to tackle um, because as I said, theory of mind is something that has not really been measured computationally. We know that theory of mind techniques are very important for communication and for explaining things to others, regardless of um, if you're talking about everyday communication or explaining movies or stories or everything else. So theory of mind is very important for humans to understand certain situations. So it definitely has a huge factor in communication that is, has not been explored. Um, I would assume that certain capacities of theory of mind has to be there for systems that create explanations. However, I think right now this is this is very implicit. So we assume that those systems have those capabilities and when they generate explanation, that explanation contains some um, some implicit techniques from theory of mind. Uh, but it would be it would be very interesting if that can be measured and uh, and made external as like driving factor of generating explanations. I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, thank you so much. That's uh, yeah, that's definitely interesting. And looking forward to read more of your work. Are there additional questions at this time? If there, are, if there are no further questions, then thank you, Venalyn, for your presentation today, and thank you all for attending, and we hope to see you at the next postdoc presentation series. I believe the next one is on the 23rd of March, so we hope to see you then. Thank Thanks you. So much. Bye.